Welcome to the Fast Leader Podcast, where we uncover the leadership life hacks that help you to experience breakout performance faster and rocket to success. And now, here's your host, customer and employee engagement expert and certified emotional intelligent practitioner, Jim Rimbach. Call Center Coach develops and unites the next generation of call center leaders. Through our e-learning and community, individuals gain knowledge and skills in the six core competencies that is the blueprint that develops high-performing call center leaders. Successful supervisors do not just happen. So go to callcentercoach.com to learn more about enrollment and download your copy of the Supervisor Success Path eBook now. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, today I am thrilled because I have somebody on the show today who's going to talk about something that I think we all can learn from at all levels of an organization, from the very top of the largest and even small organization, all the way down to the front line. Risto Salisma was born and raised in Helsinki, Finland. He had a younger sister who taught him to manage stress by constantly giving him a hard time. He got acquainted with the first personal computers at school and soon determined that he needed one himself. After working odd jobs, he managed to buy a Commodore 64 and learned how to code and become a teenage freelance journalist in the field of IT. He is a founder of F Secure Corporation, a Finnish cybersecurity company, and served as the president and CEO of the company between 1998 and 2006. Since then, he's held the position of chairman of the board of directors. He's chairman of the board of directors at Nokia Corporation. He joined the Nokia board in 2008 and became chairman of the board in 2012. Under his tenure, Nokia has successfully transformed from the mobile phone manufacturer to a leading communication technology company. He is also well known as a business angel investing in several technology startups. He is an active contributor in many European and Asian industry associations and public debate and distinguished speaker. His preferred topics are entrepreneurship, leadership, and AI or artificial intelligence. He's also the author of Transforming Nokia, The Power of Paranoid Optimism to Lead Through Colossal Change. The book has been translated into several languages. His hobbies include CrossFit, coding, and studying Chinese. He aims to instill a spirit of entrepreneurship, accountability, openness for change, and an appreciation for experimentation into both the society at large as well as the companies he works for. He currently lives in Helsinki, Finland and is married and has three children. Risto Salisma, are you ready to help us get over the hump? I'd love to do that. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Now, I've given my legion a little about you, but can you tell us what your current passion is so that we can get to know you even better? Well, perhaps my current passion is, is machine learning because I have experienced myself that as a leader, you get to stand in front of an audience and talk about various topics to communicate the company message. And oftentimes the topic that I'm talking about is not something I truly understand myself. I'm just like a parrot. Somebody has created a presentation for me. I learn it by heart and I'm fairly convincing in, in repeating those statements. I don't even know if they are true, especially if we talk about something complicated. And oftentimes leaders lose the, the ability to go back to school. And we don't only lose the ability, we lose the desire. Either because we feel that we are so high on the, on the value chain that we don't need to anymore. So we delegate learning to others. Or we are afraid that we'll reveal how stupid we are. We'll reveal that we don't know things that people assume we do. So we, we lose the ability to learn. And I was doing that for machine learning because it's such an important transformational technology. So I was trying to encourage others to learn it and to use it for the company's benefit without understanding it. So then I woke up, I had this entrepreneurial awakening and realized that I don't need to have others do it, I can do it myself. So I started coding again after a break of 30 years and started doing different machine learning models. And that has been so much fun. So maybe that's the number one passion that I have at the moment. Well, and as you're explaining and talking about the passion, and I start thinking about what you wrote about uh, and really what you lived uh, with, with Nokia, as well as going back to you starting F-Secure, which is a cybersecurity company that you're chairman of as well, is that you, you have the 
ability to really focus in on doing what is necessary. Even in the book, you talk about <laughs> at F-Secure having to clean the restrooms whenever you needed to. And you're not afraid you know, to do that. And also, when you start thinking about bringing that to a larger organization, you weren't necessarily caught up in something that you talk about, which is a toxicity of success. And I think all of us at all different levels of an organization can really fall into the trap of tox that toxicity of success. Mm -hmm. I, so I think it's important that we talk about well, what is that? Well, first of all, I'm poisoned by it as well. And I don't always realize what I'm doing wrong, but I, I try to stop and sort of think about the wider picture. Am I doing the right things? Am I thinking about the right topics? Am I thinking about those in the right way? And sometimes I see the light, sometimes I don't. And with machine learning, I'm, I'm very happy about going back to school and actually encouraging a lot of our employees to start studying. I've had so many conversations where people come to me that, I mean, engineers, that they are ashamed that their chairman knows more, knows more about their profession than they do. And then they tell me that they're spending nights and weekends studying. And that's really music to my ears because that's a cultural change. And for the chairman to do something that chairmen usually don't do, it wakes people up. And that's a, that's a very powerful leadership action to do something that you're not supposed to do. But toxicity of success means that every time you feel that you are successful, you have accomplished something, especially if others tell you that, it changes you. And that change is a insidious incremental change. It's like boiling frogs. They don't realize that the water is getting hotter. And we don't realize that we are being changed by the success that is attributed to us. Maybe deep inside we realize that it's not due to my actions that we are successful. But typically the face of the company, the CEO, is always given all the credit. And oftentimes it's the predecessor who started things going in the right direction. And therefore, the praise that you get, the feeling that I'm not worthy, but still I want to believe that, leads you to, to become afraid that you'll be revealed. So you may become less prone to taking risks, less prone to experimentation, more set on your ways because what used to work should still work. And I don't know any other way. And I don't dare experiment because I might reveal that I'm not certain of what we do. So many powerful leaders have failed because of the toxicity of their own success. Many others are afraid of the change or they are aware of the change and therefore they can resist it and they can retain their desire to learn and experiment the, the flexibility that is such an essential part of all leaders. Well, as you're talking and I start thinking about, um, you know, going through some of the transformations that was required, you know, and, and in the book you talk about just the, the, the history at the time and what was happening. I mean, there was launches of competitors when you start talking about the, the, the device of business uh, that Nokia was in at the time. And you start, you know, referring to uh, also the economic climate. You know, we're talking about back in 2008 and how that was just had some global impact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, there was some significant changes. And you had even said, be, I heard you mention before, is that when you have a culture that doesn't have some of the things that you're talking about that are so critically important, you either have to change the organization, get, you know, or you're changing the people within the organization. And the, when you start talking about, you know, the, the legacy aspects of that toxicity of success, you know, how many of those people, um, you know, do you have to get rid of, you might ask. And I think it's important to talk about where you are now in Nokia in regards to how many employees are, are, are badged as Nokia employees versus what it used to be. Well, you don't need to change the people because the people are bad. You just need to wake them up. And you can wake them up in, in many different ways. Typically, you explain to them what the problem is. What are we doing wrong? What will happen if we don't change? 
then you need to tell them in what way do we need to change? What would be good behavior? And then you need to start taking action. You need to lead from the front. You need to show symbols of changing yourself and doing your part. I remember a story about a new CEO coming to a company that had a, an actual physical rule book. And everybody in the company hated that book. They, they hated it from the bottom of their hearts. And this CEO learned about that hatred and he wanted to change the way the company operated. So he took the book, went into the parking lot where he had a big barrel, sort of an empty oil barrel, and he burnt the book in that barrel. And it was videoed and transmitted to all the employees. And it was such a powerful symbol to everybody that this CEO wanted to change the old behavior and there was no book anymore. But of course, the leadership often is fairly ingrained in their old ways. And you may need to change at least some individuals at the top, both to send the message that we are serious, as well as to get people in who naturally believe in the new way of operating, who leave that culture automatically. They don't have to learn it. They live it already. Well, to me, and I think what you're talking about, going back and connecting it with the book, and it's part of the subtitle, is you're talking about really implementing a framework that you call paranoid optimism. Now, for me, when I first saw paranoid optimism, and I just really focusing in on the first word, which means paranoid, for most people, they freak out or freeze, but that's not what you're talking about. Uh, can you explain a little bit about what paranoid optimism means? Because I think all of us, going back to what I had said uh, previously, is that we can learn that at all levels. Yeah, having been an entrepreneur for, well, since I was 22, and I, of course, faced a lot of challenges and made a lot of mistakes and, and failed time after time. And after about a 15 years of being a CEO and growing up to be a CEO, I finally realized that I actually need to stop and think about how do I lead? And how do I want to lead? What has worked for me? And what hasn't worked for me? And I realized that the way I had somehow learned to think is best expressed by those words, paranoid optimism. And I believe that that's part of entrepreneurship. It's part of the feeling of ownership and accountability for everything the company does. The, the founder of a company can never hide. We cannot run away because we are accountable. If we didn't decide something ourselves, at least we recruited the people who decided that, or we recruited the people who recruited the people who decided that. We are accountable. So therefore, we can, when we see a problem somewhere, anywhere, we can tackle that. We, can, we feel that it's our responsibility. And in order to, to preempt these challenges, you need to think what can go wrong. And when you think about what can go wrong, you can take action to prevent it. And that actually leads you to be optimistic. Because I, I have seen the sort of the, the width of the different alternatives that face the company. And I'm prepared. We are prepared. We know what to do to prevent the bad ones and execute the ones that we want to happen. So basically what I'm talking about is scenario planning. Paranoid optimism automatically leads to scenario planning. And in, a, the, in the kind of marketplace where most companies are at the moment, it's a combination of, of complexity. So something that is unpredictable and very, very complicated. And when things are unpredictable, you just cannot have a single plan. You have to have multiple plans because you don't know what will happen. And because it's complicated, you need to plan ahead. So somehow you need to combine the possibility to plan because you don't know. And the fact that if it's sufficiently complicated and you don't have a plan, you will not succeed. Therefore, scenario planning. And that's paranoid optimism for me. It starts from the sense of ownership, which leads you to think about what bad can happen. You preempt those, 
you think, what do I want to happen? You work to make that happen. And therefore, you sort of have a map in front of you where you have different paths through the future. Some of those paths are not great. Some of them lead to a disaster. Some of them are really, really good. And every day you can look at your forward-looking indicators and try to figure out on which path are you. And you feel that there's sort of a probability cloud which you can shape because every action you take will have an impact on those probabilities. And you want to shift them as much as possible towards the good paths and as much as possible away from the, the negative paths. Well, one of the core uh, elements um, and, and characteristics in emotional intelligence is called perspective taking. And I think that's what you're talking about is taking uh, different perspectives that you know, aren't the most ideal because we have to deal with them. And people call it a VUCA world, you know, with a mm -hmm. whole lot of uncertainty and, and, and all of that uh, volatility. Uh, and But when I start thinking about that whole particular process, because I've been involved with some of that sometimes in certain you know, people, they'll just continue to scenario base and do what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, what ifs. And it's like it never ends. It's like, okay, we kind of have to start, stop this creative thinking process because it's just going way on too long. And we have to start actually executing because one of the biggest problems in organizations is really execution. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's getting things done. Uh, so how do you actually put some parameters on that whole, you know, scenario based component so that you're just not doing that and never taking action. Well, the idea is that you take action every day. If there's a scenario attached to which you cannot come up with good actions, then it's not a good scenario. It's not a real scenario. Let's, let's take an example. Back in the days when the iPhone was new and Android was just coming to the market and Nokia Symbian ecosystem was going down the drain under the pressure of, of the iPhone mostly, but also Android devices. And we were wondering, what can we do? And we had partnered with Microsoft on the Windows phone in an exclusive relationship. Our market share remained very, very low. And we couldn't really see Windows phone winning against Android and iPhone. So what are the scenarios that could happen? Microsoft had announced that they want to become a devices and services company. So maybe they wanted to start making their own smartphones. That was a scenario, a disastrous scenario for Nokia, because we had an exclusive relationship with Microsoft. And if they become our competitor, we would still have an exclusive relationship with them and we couldn't get out of that relationship. So how could Microsoft start making mobile phones? or smartphones, they could acquire somebody. Okay, who could they acquire? They could acquire HTC. So how do we know if they are in the process of acquiring them? Okay, what can we do? We can talk to the investment bankers who often slip something by. We can go and meet with the HTC CEO, not asking him whether he's in discussions with Microsoft, but exploring strategic partnerships exploring if there's some way we can do more with them and we can we can sense if there's something going on so just as an example down a tree of multiple scenarios we end up at a sort of a leaf in that tree which is hdc and microsoft and what actions can we take well we can go and meet the ceo we can talk to investment bankers we can put our feelers out at least something we can do. And then, of course, we can plan ahead if they would decide to announce such, a, such an acquisition, what would we do? We would sue Microsoft. So let's do a study in advance based on what could we sue them. And maybe we can even do some preparatory work in order to sue them the same day they announce. We are not caught by surprise because it's not under our control whether Microsoft buys HTC or not. We can try to influence it, but in the end, those two companies will make their own decisions. So almost anything you think about, you can dress up in scenarios, and it soon becomes a tree. 
but you don't want it to become a hedge because then it's just too much work to do and you get buried under the different scenarios. And that's of course the typical challenge where you have to find a balance. And there's no one way of doing that. You just have to figure out your own way in your own situation. How many scenarios is reasonable? Well, and talk, talking about the whole scenario components, and I think there's one, of the, one of the, I think it's a tactic that I think is critically important that again, all of us at all levels could really focus in on is you talk about three questions that reveal uh, the right facts, you know, are, are we discussing the right things? Because when we start, you know, looking at you know, the scenario components, when we start thinking about just own internal meetings, I think we can always start asking these questions and they are, are we discussing the right things? Are we discussing the right things in the right way? And are we comfortable challenging uh, the leader's opinions? And all the less, several components in the book and you finally start talking about it is this trust element. Um, and having that freedom and security and, and not feeling like there's going to be any repercussions when you actually do all of that challenging. So, so some of those values and components have to be there. And you talk about that in the entrepreneurial leadership. And there's 10 things that you talk about in that. We'll get to that in a second. But when you start talking about these three questions, to me, it's not just that you're asking them internally. I think you're also kind of taking that outside the organization and starting getting to the customer, start getting to you know, maybe suppliers, and, and you're continually asking those types of questions to see if you're focusing on the right things, which will feed the scenario-based planning. Um, th I mean, so when you start looking at those three questions, would you do something different when I start thinking about those forward-thinking indicators and where we're going? Um, and how, how, how would that particularly change, or would it still be the same three mm -hmm. questions? Well, I think those three questions work really well if you are a new leader in a new situation. Let's say you're hired as the CEO, you're hired as a project manager in a company you haven't worked for before. And you get to your team and you want to know whether the team culture is a good one. So you observe in your own team, also in your manager's team as part of the, a department leadership team or the, the company leadership team. And you want to ask yourself those three questions. Are we talking about the right topics? Is there something that we are missing? Are we only talking about a single plan without any alternatives? Are we at all thinking about how things could go wrong? Are we just optimists and not at all paranoid? And then you want to think about are we talking about things in the right way? Therefore, is it okay to challenge others in, with respect? Is it okay to to voice concerns. Is it okay to, for example, ask the team, hey, what's the big thing we will miss next? Most technology companies have missed a big generational shift at some time. Nokia definitely has, and it almost killed the company. So just a half a year ago, our new head of mobile networks sent them not an email, but a social media message in the company's social media platform to all employees, asking them, what's the next big thing we will miss? And I think asking such a question is a great cultural message. It means that the leaders can ask questions about failing, of course, in order to prevent that failure. And then the third one, can we challenge the leader? If we can't, then we have a emperor without clothes, at least possibly. Because when the leader starts failing, we will not be able to challenge the leader. It's better to start challenging the leader under good times, because then it will not be such a surprise when the leader is challenged during bad times. We, we learn how to do that with respect, and probably we prevent from those bad times from, from happening. Well, what you're talking about there is you mentioned in the book something about the shattering complacency, <laughs> and that is we always have to be unsettled to, to a certain degree. And I think ultimately from a cultural perspective, and you kind of said this yourself, is that you're creating a culture of continuous learning. I mean, it, ne it never ends. I mean, it's, it's a daily element. And for you, when you even start talking about going back and learning the code and, 
you know, oftentimes when you start even thinking about like, for example, the differences between machine learning and AI, those are two different things, but oftentimes they get lumped together. And if you don't know that, and you're talking about that in a modern business environment, you, like you said, you could have, you know, a whole lot of trust issues that result because of that, because you don't quite know. So that learning component and that humility uh, are critical core values that today's organization must have. Otherwise, they fall into that same toxicity of success and mm-hmm. it becomes a, ne- a never-ending, you know, cycle and downward spiral. And like in the book, you even mentioned, you talk about, you know, RIM and all of them that, you know, essentially just went away because they could not break the cycle, um, the downward spiral. But again, I think we're talking about, and in the book, I see it over and over, I ha- um, that you're really talking about building high-performing teams. And I had the opportunity to have Douglas Gerber on the show, he's episode 223, mm-hmm. he talks about measuring your opportunities to be able to build that high-performing team. And if, I, if I'm talking about building the high-performing teams, I think it goes into what you had talked about in that entrepreneurial leadership. And, and that's what I said I wanted to get to and hit those 10 points because, again, I think all of us can leverage these things. Now, I'm not going to put you on the spot and say name all 10, but um, I, I would like to kind of hit on a couple of these, but I'm going to read them real quick because I want you to talk about some that are critically important that without fail, we have to make sure that we're executing upon. So you talk about holding yourself accountable, facing facts, being persistent, managing risks, be a learning addict, maintain an unwavering, uh, un- unwavering what do you see, uh, focus, Look to the horizon, build a team of people you like and respect, ask why, and never stop dreaming. Now, obviously, they're all important, but when you start looking at some that are without fail we must have, in your opinion, what are they? Well, at the core of entrepreneurship, as I mentioned before, is the idea that you are accountable. And you can get that feeling of, ownership and accountability regardless of the job you hold as a young teenager while i was coding during the the night in the evenings i worked in a butcher's shop and the team that worked there selling meat to customers had such pride in what they did they wanted to be the best in that and when there was a dirty spot somewhere, the first person who saw that cleaned it up. It was not that I'm here to sell, it's not my job to clean, it's that it's all hands on on deck all the time so that we can have pride in what we do. So that sense of ownership, how do you teach that to others? How do you help others to feel that? I've often said that in a way, a job could be compared to a car. And most people don't wash their rental cars. Why don't they wash it? Even if they rent it for two weeks, they typically never wash it, even if it gets really dirty, because they don't have that sense of ownership. If it's your own car, you have more of a sense of pride for the car, and you take good care of that. So for people who think of their job as a rental car, I think it's, it's an unfair situation. They deserve better. The company deserves better and the people deserve better. So if you feel that way, find a new job. Something that you feel that pride for. And then you can have that sense of ownership and that sense of accountability. And the company as well, they need to take action in order for as many as possible of their people to feel that sense of ownership. So that's at the core of everything. Maybe I'll mention another one from your list, which is giving, giving me a lot of trouble. And that's partially about the trust that permeates and has to permeate everything. But it's about hiring a team that you genuinely like and respect. Because there are so many very, very successful tech companies where the top leader is not a nice person person we know we all know many examples and some of our most respected tech leaders exhibit this behavior and it bothers me deeply 
I, I sort of have to believe that you can be more successful if you take good care of your people. If you are not prone to, to you know, getting really angry really quickly without reason, without cause. If you treat people with respect, you, you need to always have respect for your people in order to create trust and that sense of camaraderie. And I struggle with what's going on in, in this industry. And maybe you have some consolation for me. Maybe you can explain how come. But I have to believe that being a good leader in the way that I define good leadership actually increases the probability for your business to be truly successful. Well, for me, I think what you had said a while back, a while back in this interview is critically important. Uh, then you talked about leading and modeling from up front. I think if uh, you start looking at you know people who are in positions of power that you know aren't really focusing in on the employee experience and the human experience uh, internally, um, ultimately are going to pay the price because it's going to affect the external experience. And that's one of the things that we talk about a lot. And so. You know, things take care of themselves and the world ultimately writes itself. I mean, it, it, and sometimes it just takes a little while, but those companies will have the same downward spiral, spiral because they do have that toxic environment. Uh, and, you know, nature just kind of weeds those out after a while because they become less agile, less adaptable. And, and it's what you even talk about in the book. To me, it was all of that. And like you said, sometimes it's that it was the environment I was in. I'm not really that type of person, but I'm stuck in it. Um, yeah. and really when they get the opportunity, those people, they become your champions, uh, in the transformation. So and when you I, sort of become your environment. Absolutely. And I know I'm a victim that I tell my kids that all the time. And so that's why we said, you know, I'll tell them, I'll say, you know, am I going to, uh, essentially tell you who your friends are supposed to be? Yes, I will, because I know it's going to impact your behavior. Well, you've actually shared a lot of your stories and on the show we talk about getting over the hump and you actually hit several three, you see you hit about three or more within that. And so I appreciate you sharing those stories. And the book is actually loaded with a lot of situations that you came across that you had to do things differently and you therefore got over the hump. And obviously it became a positive outcome as a whole because now uh, Nokia is really leading the way in, in 5G infrastructure um, and, and uh, the, what we're going to be seeing as a huge impact and effect to our lives with the Internet of Things and all of that. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I know that you're going to continue to have significant amounts of success. But when we start going through all of this, one of the things that we need is that inspiration um, in order to have some of the resilience and transformation. And on the show, one of the things that we like to focus in on are quotes. So is there a quote or two that you like that you can share? Well, one of my favorite quotes, in my opinion, defines entrepreneurship in a perfect way. And the, the quote goes something like this. There are those among us who's, who see things as they are, and they ask why. And there are those that dream of things that never were, and ask why not. And that first part, people who observe the environment, they ask why, they are curious, they are like scientists. They want to understand how things work. But then people who dream of things that never were, then ask, hey, why not? They are entrepreneurs. They change things. They build things that never were. And I think that's a, that's a beautifully said and a great definition for entrepreneurship, even if it was not originally meant that way. I think that's a great, um, uh, really value statement when you start thinking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, also, when I start looking at where you are and the things that you're doing with coding, you talked about machine learning. I mean, I, I know artificial intelligence is also important to you. Um, you know, being able to create a culture of high-performing uh, high teams. Um, you talked about a lot of different things associated with transformation, all of that. But when I start thinking about goals, I'm sure you have several, but I'd like you to focus in on one. So could you share with us what is one goal that you have? Be a good human being. 
Because in the end, when we think back about our lives, I don't think we will be thinking about money or titles or medals or we think about our family, we think about our friends, we think about our colleagues who hopefully are also friends. And with all these people, we want to feel a sense of trust. They trust me. I'm trustworthy. I can trust them because they want to do right by me. And we respect each other. And I believe that my life is a long search for people that I really like to have close to me. And there aren't that many people who really you can trust, unfortunately. But when you find one, grab on to him or her. Do what you can. Spare no effort in keeping that person close to you. Because it's, it's rare to find these people. And the Fast Leader Legion wishes you the very best. Now, before we move on, let's get a quick word from our sponsor. An even better place to work is an easy-to-use solution that gives you a continuous diagnostic on employee engagement along with integrated activities that will improve employee engagement and leadership skills in everyone. Using this award-winning solution is guaranteed to create motivated, productive, and loyal employees who have great work relationships with their colleagues and your customers. To learn more about an even better place to work, visit beyondmorale.com forward slash better. All right, here we go, Fast Leader Legion. It's time for the Home Day Hoedown. Okay, Risto, the Hump Day Hoedown is the part of our show where you give us good insights fast. So I'm going to ask you several questions. And your job is to give us robust yet rapid responses that are going to help us move onward and upward faster. Risto, I'm a, I'm a Finn. <laughs> I'm usually not fast because I, I like to think things through. Oh, that's just fine. But are you ready to hoedown? Yeah. All right. So what is holding you back from being an even better leader today? I am. What is the best leadership advice you have ever received? As you can see, I'm not, not really quick here because I want to find the absolute best advice that I have received. Probably you know, be openly who you are with your failures and weaknesses. Don't try to hide. What is one of your secrets that you believe contributes to your success? I really love learning. What do you feel is one of your best tools that helps you lead in business or life? Scenario planning. And what would be one book that you'd recommend to our Legion? And it could be from any genre. And of course, we're going to put a link to Transforming Nokia on your show notes page as well. Well, probably the book, there's a strategy for your strategy. Because I'm intellectually drawn to that concept. It, it asks you to think about things at a higher abstraction level. Not just work on your strategy, but actually realize that you have to have a strategy for creating your strategy. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, you can find links to that and other bonus information from today's show by going to fastleader.net slash Risto Salasma. Okay, Risto, this is my last hump day hold on question. All right. I imagine you were given the opportunity to go back to the age of 25 and you can take all the knowledge and skills that you have now back with you, but you can't take every single thing. You can only choose one. So what skill or piece of knowledge would you take back with you and why? I would probably take sort of self-knowledge because that would have helped me be open with who I am without trying to pretend that I know more or I'm better than I actually were. That would have helped me learning faster. And it's, it's the core piece of self-confidence. Because if you, if you really can be who you are, you are self-confident. You are self-confident enough to be weak and not know things. And that helps you learn. Risto, it was an honor to spend time with you today. Can you please share with the Fast Leader Legion how they can connect with you? Well, I'm very active on LinkedIn, very active on Twitter, and I can be easily reached through both. Risto Salasma, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. The Fast Leader Legion honors you and thanks you for helping us get over the hump. Woo-hoo! 
Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster.